following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, a refugee story of empowerment. It's about us. And even the Queen of Sweden wants to hear about her journey. God loved me, and he was in my life from the beginning. Plus, unleash your weapons of war. Bill Hammond reveals how to wage spiritual warfare against the enemy. And one woman's greatest birthday present. It was 100% clear. Complete deliverance from years of pain. I know that God cares about all of us. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. President Trump is meeting with congressional leaders from both parties again today, but it doesn't look like there's any resolution in sight to the battle over funding for the president's border wall. The meeting comes after the president brought out border patrol agents to help make his case for a wall. Jennifer Wishon brings us the story from Washington. It's day 14 of the partial government shutdown. While talks remain open, both sides are dug deep into their respective trenches. In a surprise appearance to the White House press briefing room. Happy New Year to everybody. President Trump brought firsthand witnesses to back up his case. Border Patrol agents willing to suffer through a shutdown to gain a physical barrier at the border. I promise you that if you interview Border Patrol agents, they will tell you that walls work. I worked in Naco, Arizona for 10 years. We didn't have physical barriers in Naco, and illegal immigration and drug smuggling was absolutely out of control. You all got to ask yourself this question. If I come to your home, do you want me to knock on the front door? Or do you want me to climb through that window? The president followed up by tweeting this dramatic video that includes a past message from Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer. Illegal immigration is wrong, plain and simple. The shutdown is only because of the 2020 presidential election. For them, strictly politics, the president tweeted, feeling emboldened by his base. I have never had so much support as I have in the last week over my stance for border security, for border control, and for, frankly, the wall or the barrier. Across town, Nancy Pelosi reclaimed the speaker's gavel for the first time in eight years. Her new House majority passed legislation to reopen most of the government and buy more time to negotiate funding with the White House for Homeland Security. But for now, Democrats aren't budging on the president's demands for wall funding. The fact is, a wall is an immorality. It's not who we are as a nation. The House legislation is nearly identical to what the Senate passed before Christmas, but Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says that's now out the window because it won't pay for the wall. The Senate will not take up any proposal that does not have a real chance of passing this chamber and getting a presidential signature. As this standoff continues, on day one of the new Congress, two veteran House Democrats introduced articles of impeachment against President Trump, while new Muslim Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib of Michigan, the first Palestinian American woman in Congress, cursed the president in her call for impeachment. And in an interview with NBC News, Speaker Pelosi says she won't rule out the possibility of impeachment or indictment, but says she's waiting for special counsel Robert Mueller's final report. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Washington. Well, welcome to a new year in Washington. Uh, and the division seems to be even wider and the radicalization seems to be even stronger. Uh, but there is a new player back uh, back in the speaker's uh, chair, and here's what her daughter had to say. This is a quote from Nancy Pelosi's daughter. She can cut off your head and you won't even know you're bleeding. So we're in for a whole new uh, two-year run here until the 2020 elections. Uh, will the government stay shut down for that period of time? I don't know, but it, I don't see any solution in any kind of near term. Uh, it, now more than ever, we need to pray for our government and pray that the divisions that are so obvious uh, somehow get healed. Uh, I don't see any solution other than an absolute miracle. Well, in other news, the economy was very strong in 2018. The jobs report 
uh, out today was absolutely fantastic. But there's another report that says the outlook may not be as good for the, for the coming year. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That's right, Gordon. Another sign of an economic slowdown as a key index for American manufacturers and factories grew at the slowest rate in two years. The drop in the index is still another indication that slower growth in China and Europe is also hurting the U.S. economy. The weaker economy in China is sending other signals like fewer iPhone sales. The stock market has been falling in recent weeks, with investors anticipating a slowdown in the months ahead. Even though for now the economy seems strong, with unemployment still very low. Well, a new president took power in Brazil this week, and he's promising to do whatever it takes to make a dent in the country's years-long out-of-control crime. Chuck Holton visited Rio de Janeiro and went on patrol with an elite team of Brazilian special operations police who are leading the move to take down the drug gangs. Rival drug gangs battling for territory across Brazil have driven its murder rate to more than 60,000 per year. In the poorest communities, called favelas, a young man there is more likely to die by gunfire than a soldier in an active war zone. This young mother of two asked that we not reveal her name. Our main problem is all the violence. Sometimes I can't even take my kids to school or even my baby to the hospital if he's sick. When we're at the house and the shooting starts outside, I'm already teaching my children to lie down on the floor and not move. Straight bullets are very common here. Fed up with the violence, in October 2018, the Brazilian people elected a new president, Jair Bolsonaro, a former army captain who promised to take a tough stance on crime. Bolsonaro is committed to stepping up enforcement in the worst neighborhoods, even sending troops into the favelas to take on the gangs. One of the most elite and well-armed police units is known as BOPE. The mission of BOPE is to act in situations where the local police cannot. For example, hostage situations, combating drug dealers and protecting the population through specialized operations. Despite being a military force, we are actually part of the police and we use specialized equipment and weapons. This favela that they're training in today is one that they've already cleared, so we know that it's safe. But you can see the tactical way that they learn to move, and that's because you don't really know who the bad guys are until they're shooting at you. And as you can see, there are women and children in here, and they uh, you know, have to go right by all these civilians. And the level of training that it takes to keep from shooting people that don't need to be shot is really high. Our first priority is to always protect the lives of the citizens. We must be very aggressive, however, because the sheer amount of violence in the areas where we operate. Victory for us is going into battle against these gangs who often bring superior numbers and winning without losing any of our men. But for the people living in these favelas, victory might simply look like making it home safely one more day. From Rio de Janeiro, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Chuck, thank you. Well, in Israel, politicians are forming new alliances in preparation for early elections coming up in a few months in April. The turmoil could also affect U.S.-Israeli relations and President Trump's yet-to-be-revealed peace plan. CBN News Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell looks at what to expect from the upcoming changes. Israel's political system is gearing up for the April elections. So there's a lot of musical chairs uh, in Israeli politics. Uh, lots of parties splinter off, form new parties. One shift... Education Minister Naftali Bennett and Justice Minister Ayelet Shaked are starting a religious secular party called the New Right. Another key member, they're now joined by author and columnist Carolyn Glick. The biggest surprise came on live TV when Labour Party leader Avi Gabay ended his alliance with Zippy Livni's Hatanua party in what some called a divorce. One goal unites left-wing parties, defeat Netanyahu. According to Professor Eugene Kantorovich, that's not likely to happen. When you look at the polls, there's really no way any left-wing coalition can form a government. But I think very likely the results of the elections when all is said and done is going to be a continuation of very much something like the current coalition. A wild card could be if Netanyahu is indicted before the elections on corruption charges. Legally, he can still run and if indicted after the elections, would not be forced to step down. It's hard to know how that might affect voting. According to Professor Ephraim Inbar, the Israeli swing to the right is largely due to the failed peace process. After the Oslo peace process failed, 
the Israeli electorate became more cautious uh, and uh, blames basically the labor and the left. Early elections will likely further delay details of President Trump's Israeli-Palestinian peace plan. President Trump's plan uh, is very optimistic. Uh, he's taking a shot, but I think the chances that the Palestinians will accept this plan are basically zero. They've said so already. So it doesn't matter too much what government there is in Israel when any Palestinian government is going to reject it. The Palestinians have a Hamas. The only deal they are ready to accept is the Jews in the sea. So uh, they want to destroy the Jewish state. You know, what kind of deal can we make when part of the national uh, Palestinian movement is, has this type of, of attitude? Though unnamed sources indicate Trump prefers a Netanyahu-led government, analysts agree U.S.-Israel relations should remain strong in any case. Netanyahu was successful having a bumpy but correct relationship with President Obama. So uh, uh, we will adapt ourselves to whatever government uh, there is in, in Washington. One of the most important things about this election is if 2020 brings with it a different president who is likely to have a much more critical policy towards Israel, much more resembling that of President Obama, having a government that is prepared to stand up to that, to not buckle under the great pressure that they will undoubtedly be placed in, will be very important. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Gordon, it's hard to believe, but with all those shifting alliances, it makes the politics here in the U.S. look rather tame. I don't know how tame politics is here in the U.S., but Israeli politics is remarkably complicated. Uh, and a whole political system that has multiple po parties and multiple alliances, and things just keep getting reformed and remade. Uh, the good news is this upcoming April election will be free of U.S. interference. Uh, the last time they stood for election, uh, Obama was actively campaigning against Netanyahu. Uh, he wanted to get a peace deal done before the end of his presidency, and he thought Netanyahu was in the way. So he was trying to get him removed from office. So that's not going to happen, but we'll see what happens. The prediction is uh, the government's going to stay as is. The coalition may change, but Netanyahu will stay in uh, as prime minister, and we'll see if that happens. Terry? Well, up next, meet a pastor in Sweden who's led more than 1,500 Muslims to Christ and hear how she was once a Muslim herself, trapped in an abusive marriage. Her story is coming up. The huge numbers of Muslims immigrating to Sweden have become a serious problem for the nation. But one of those immigrants is now the Christian pastor of two churches, and she's led more than 1,500 Muslims to Christ. Dale Hurd brings us her story from Stockholm. No one would have thought a Muslim woman in Iran simply trying to stay alive in an abusive marriage would one day lead two churches in Sweden lead more than a thousand former Muslims to Christ and be invited to speak before the Queen of Sweden. As a young woman in a Muslim culture, Anahita Parson was powerless and insignificant. Her only hope was that she might one day find a good husband, and she did. But he died suddenly in an accident, and she found herself trapped in a second marriage so violent she expected to die. I didn't know anything. It was darkness. It was a very bad life. Although she writes about the abuse in her book, Stranger No More, Parson doesn't like to talk about it. Uh, it's not easy about uh, speak about that. You were beaten with a shovel. Yes. As a battered wife, living with bruises and cuts all over her body, Parson eventually tried to kill herself with pills, but she was revived at a hospital. Anahita's daughter Roxana remembers when her dad threatened to slit her throat when she was just a small child. I remember we, we had gotten cookies. My mom baked cookies. We got cookies. And then we went for another, uh, another turn, like we wanted more cookies. Super normal. And we ran up and we're like, more cookies, more cookies. And he came up with a knife, put it to my throat. And he said, ask for cookies again. She was striving to just survive for us, just survive to make a better life for us. And maybe that was something God had implanted in her so that she would have something to hold on to. 
Anahita Parson's journey to Christ and across two continents is the stuff of Hollywood movies, and one that would include several brushes with death. Parson, her husband, and two children fled Iran through the mountains to Turkey in 1984, where she and Roxana faced more brushes with death before landing in Turkey's notorious Agri prison. They would finally make it to Denmark, where she divorced her still abusive husband, and she heard the gospel for the first time. Then she moved to Sweden, where she and her two children would walk into a church and announce that we are Christians from now on. Anahita entered the ministry in 2012 and has led more than 1,500 Muslims to Christ. She not only leads two churches, but trains other churches on how to reach and disciple former Muslims like these, who fill her church each Sunday, hungry for the God who loves. Parson believes this was foretold in Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 39. But in the latter days, I will restore the fortunes of Elam, declares the Lord. It is about Elam, and Elam is Persian. When I read that, I know it. It's about us. It's about our life. And uh, it's amazing. God told Jeremiah that time, and it's happened just now. But Muslim immigration has also made Sweden a home for dangerous radicals. And Parson told us she's received death threats and lives with the knowledge she could be killed. It's a free country, but uh, it's dangerous. Too. Were you saying that sometimes you wonder if it's your last day? Sometimes. As a young woman living what seemed like a hopeless existence in Iran, Anahita Parson saw no plan and no purpose in her abusive marriage, only random violence. But God had a plan, a plan for her to one day be a leading pastor in Sweden. I, I think God loved me and he was in my life from the beginning. He's my everything. I think it's, um, wow, it's beautiful. Dale heard CBN News in Stockholm, Sweden. What a wonderful story, what a wonderful legacy, that God is always with us and he always fulfills his promise. He watches over his word to perform it. Uh, and what a wonderful prophecy to, to read in, in Jeremiah and say, this is for me. Here's something you may not know if you have a quiz. Here's the quiz. What nation has the fastest growing Christian population? And I'm not talking about total numbers. If you're talking total numbers, then you're talking China. But in terms of percentage of the population, how many are coming to become Christians? Well, the number one nation in the world is Iran. Uh, so revival is happening there. When you see all these horrible headlines coming out, all their threats against Israel, uh, look up because their redemption is drawing nigh. Well, Anahita Parsons' book is called Stranger No More, and it's available wherever books are sold. Terry? Well, coming up, a serious ear infection threatens to ruin a woman's vacation. It was really, really painful. That was just devastating to me because that was our whole trip. We'd planned everything around scuba diving and fishing. See how she's supernaturally healed just in time to make the best dive of her life. Well, many of you have sent us your prayer requests for 2019, and we're going to be praying for them in just a few minutes. You may have received this booklet in the mail called God's Promises for the Days Ahead. It's filled with inspiring scriptures, and we want it to encourage you throughout this upcoming year. If you haven't received the booklet, go to cbn.com, or you can call us at 1-800-700-7000. And when you contact us, just tell us how we can pray for you. Well, right now, we want to show you an amazing answer to prayer. Susan O'Daniel and her husband have been planning their vacation all year long. They were both looking forward to scuba diving and fishing. But the day before they were supposed to leave, Payne drove Susan to see her doctor, and he quickly put the brakes on her vacation plans. Many, many years ago in 1987, had a really, really bad car accident, and then I had a punctured right eardrum. That uh, led me to consistent problems throughout the years. The pain is a, a deep pain. It goes deep inside my head and causes me to be dizzy. It, 
so I lose my balance a lot. And then it, every now and then it will get to be an, an infection kind of a situation where it's quite painful. It started to get probably the worst infection I've had. Truth be told, I, I didn't want my husband to know how bad it was because of the vacation coming. I would just kind of go along with what it was fine. We were leaving for our vacation the last day of June, and, and it was the 29th of June that all of a sudden it came on with fury, and it was really, really painful. And then went back to the doctor, and he said, this is serious, and there's a problem with your eustachian tube. I really need you to see an ENT. And I explained we were leaving the next day, and I said, we've been planning this trip all year, and scuba diving is our thing, and we really want to go. And he said, no, you're, I do not recommend you scuba dive, because it can cause permanent damage. And that was just devastating to me, because that was our whole trip. We'd planned everything around scuba diving and fishing. And it was my birthday, too. That was our huge vacation that we planned all year long. It was the only time we had to get away. And so I got there, uh, we, we did go fishing on my birthday and had a wonderful time. But <laughs> I was in so much pain that day, but I knew that as soon as I got home, I was gonna have to tell him, I need to cancel the trip tomorrow, I can't do it. So we got, got home that day from fishing and then we sat down on the couch and, and the 700 Club came on. And at the end of the show, Gordon was on that day and he was going to pray for people. Now, Terry and I are going to pray. I want you to pray with us if you have a need. So I took my husband's hand, and we held hands, and then I held my other hand over my ear, and I thought, oh, please, God, I just want to go diving, and as silly as that sounds, in the big picture, it's an earache on my birthday, you know, but to me, I know that God cares about all of us. And so I held hands, and I held my hand over my ear, and then Gordon, immediately said. Now, someone else with problems with the eustachian tube in your right ear, a blockage, that's affected your hearing, it's affected everything, balance, everything. God's just cleansing all of that out. He's opening up now in mm -hmm. Jesus' name. Be healed, be made whole. And my pain was probably 75% gone. And I said, well, I, I think maybe I'll be able to dive tomorrow. Well, I went to bed that night and I woke up in the morning and it was 100% clear. I felt perfect and I have not had an issue since then. We went ahead and, and went on the trip. We had a dive um, master go down with us to show us around and we had two of the best, best dives we've had in, in our whole time diving together. There is a Bible verse that says, God is good to all. His mercy is over all that He has created. And that includes even the little things as well as the big miracles. You know, sometimes we feel like we can't ask God for things that seem little to us because He's busy running the universe. But He already knows your need, even as He knew Susan's need. And God is so faithful. He's so generous, so kind, and so merciful in every way. And so today we want to read some requests that have come in. Uh, right where you're at, even if you haven't sent your requests in, we want to pray for you today. So. Uh, Pray with us as we move forward with all of this. Gordon, here's someone asking for God's protection and strength for all Christians in the Middle East who are experiencing persecution. Someone saying, pray that my husband be saved and delivered from alcoholism. Another request that my 18-month-old granddaughter be healed of complications from spina bifida and then healing from congestive heart failure. What do you have there? I've got uh, total healing for me and my daughter after knee surgeries on January 2 and then healing from 20 years of debilitating migraines. God wants to heal. Just get that set. God wants to heal. What is He waiting for? What is He looking for? Well, He's always looking for faith. Uh, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro over the whole earth to show Himself strong. For who? For those whose hearts are loyal to Him. Now, no matter how small the problem is, no matter how big the problem is. God is the answer. And don't be afraid of coming to Him with your request. He wants to be your loving Father. He wants to supply your every need. He wants to be your all in all. All He's looking for is for you to say, yes, Daddy, uh, I need this. Uh, I need your help. I need it now. I can't do this on my own. You can do it. Would you help me? 
And when you have that faith, just like a little child, to say, I know Daddy wants to help. I know he wants to be with me. I know he loves me. When you have that faith, well, that's what he responds to. So in an act of faith, do exactly what Susan did. She laid a hand on that area of the body that needs healing. And Terry and I are going to agree. And here's a wonderful verse. When two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. These are the words of Jesus, and you can count on them. You can depend on them. So we're going to do that. If there's somebody with you, ask them to hold your hand. Ask them to lay hands on you, too. Let's agree touching it, and let's see what God will do. Mm -hmm. Lord, we just lift the needs of the audience to you right now. And as people in an act of faith, depending on you, lay their hands on that area of the body that needs healing, we come into agreement with them. And we say over their bodies now, we say it out loud, be healed and be made whole in the name of Jesus. My body is healed right now by the stripes, by the blood, and by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I believe it. I receive it now into my body, and I am completely whole from this day forward. I declare it now, and I receive it now in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone, your name is Jerome. You've got your hand over your left ear. You've had a punctured eardrum, and God is healing you and restoring your hearing restoring everything about it. All of that pain just left you now. You're feeling like a breeze go, go over your ear right now. In Jesus' name, receive it and be made whole. Terry? Um, there's someone else. You have a problem with calluses, um, specifically on your hands and your feet. It's due to work that you did when you were much younger, but it affects your ability to feel strongly, so you, you walk with instability and your hands aren't able to do some of the things they could. God's healing that condition for you right now. You're just going to have that agility and mobility and sense of touch back again. Uh, you've, there's someone, you've got excess calcium deposits in, in your spine, and it's particularly a problem in your neck, and you've got your right hand over the right side of the back of your neck. In Jesus' name, be healed. Calcium levels be normal now. In the name of Jesus, movement come back. All muscle tension and all trauma be relieved now. Let there be no more pain, no more discomfort, and free movement now in the name of Jesus. And someone else, you have an issue with your eyes. It's almost like a thin film um, that you can't see through very clearly. God is just removing that. Right now, your vision is going to be restored to normal. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that you are the healer. You are the restorer, you are the deliverer, you set the captive free, yes. and we just declare freedom over everyone now. Freedom from fear, anxiety, yes. depression, in Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. If you've been touched by God, share your good report. Let us know what God has done for you today. Call us, 1-800-700-7000, and realize we're here for you. And we believe in prevailing prayer. That's the prayer that gets an answer. That's the prayer that doesn't give up. So if you need prayer, we're here. It's our honor, our privilege to pray for you. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, still ahead, the Australian, who's known as the hottest Christian children's entertainer in the world, talks about his favorite cartoon. Kids are captivated by things that are entertaining, and that's what I love about Superbook. It's visually engaging, but also presents great truth. See how Sean W. Smith is using Superbook to tell the stories of the Bible to half a million children worldwide. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. While schools and government monuments across the country are deleting God from their buildings, the state of Mississippi has other plans. The state's new license plates now display the words, In God We Trust. Republican Governor Phil Bryant announced the move last May in a tweet. He wrote, I was proud to sign legislation in 2014 that added the United States national motto, In God We Trust, to the Mississippi State Seal. 
He continued saying, today, I'm equally delighted to announce that it will adorn our new Mississippi license plates. Bryant told residents to expect to see the new plates sometime this year. Well, Operation Blessing is helping a single mother of four put food on the table. Tiffany was working long hours as a hairdresser and taking as many clients as she could, but it still wasn't enough to always feed her family. Then she found Operation Blessing's school lunch program. Now, not only were her children able to get assistance buying lunch at school every day, but during breaks and over weekends, Operation Blessing teams handed out bags of groceries to bring home. Tiffany says thanks to Operation Blessing, they now always have breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Well, you can find out more about Operation Blessing by visiting its website at ob.org. Gordon and Terry will be back with more of today's 700 Club right after this. Well, you may not be familiar with Sean W. Smith, but half a million kids worldwide know exactly who he is. Sean specializes in connecting children with the Bible in entertaining ways that captivate their interest. And recently, he's been using CBN Superbook to help him do just that. Sean W. Smith is an internationally acclaimed speaker and musician from Australia, who's been called the hottest Christian children's entertainer in the world. Working with children is wonderful. They, they've got joy. They're, they're full of hope. It's, I can see why Jesus said, you know, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven unless you think like a child. You've got the heart of a child. Were you willing to just believe? Last year, this world-renowned entertainer began including excerpts from CBN's Superbook in his appearances. I just love Superbook from my kids and our family. And so I want to show you a little clip of Superbook up on the screen. Hi, we're back. And kids are captivated by things that are entertaining and that's what I love about Superbook. It's visually engaging but also presents great truth. It doesn't just present the Bible story but it presents the practical application with Chris and Joy. How does this outwork in my day-to-day -day life? And kids learning the heart of generosity through episodes of Superbook, learning courage, learning to stand up for what's right. I think that's the power of Superbook. It readies your kids to be battle ready for life. In fact, Sean gives out free Superbook DVDs at his appearances. I'm not sponsored by Superbook. I just love it. Everywhere I go, I will tell people, if you don't have Superbook, you need to go check it out. Sean says now is the time to tell the world about Jesus. And he's thankful that Superbook is helping him do just that. I definitely believe that children can be led to Christ through Superbook. We did a couple of big outreaches and we went into many public schools and we had hundreds and hundreds of families come and, and we were able to give every family that made a decision to say yes to Jesus, to give them a copy of Superbook. I wanna thank the partners of Superbook for investing. Thank you for all the people that work hard. Thank you for the people that have a spirit of excellence. We appreciate you and uh, we look forward to being able to help make Superbook famous all over this earth. That's our goal, to make Superbook famous, make Jesus famous all over the world, make the stories of the Bible available to children in their own language. We're up to 43 languages now, and we've got a broadcast map showing you all the different places where Superbook is currently being aired. We've had significant breakthroughs just in the past two months in Japan. Uh, we're looking forward to season two broadcasting there. Uh, but you can be a part of this. You can be a part of sending the stories of the Bible to the children of the world. How? By joining the Superbook Club. How much is that? Well, it's $25 a month, and you get episodes. And when we release new episodes, you get not just one copy, you get three copies. Right now, we've got Superbook Explorer, which has two episodes in it. Uh, one is Elisha and the Syrians. The other is Peter and Cornelius. And not only will you get the episode, you'll also get all the historical background, the archaeology that we put into these episodes, and then the theology. How does this episode relate to God's plan of salvation? It's all yours when you join, so call 1-800-700-7000, or you can go to CBN.com. Terry? Well, up next, a call to arms. Dr. Bill Hammond shows Christians how to take up God's weapons of war when we come back. Well, Bill Hammond has prophesied to more than 50,000 people. He's provided training in prophetic ministry for more than 250,000. And his latest book is a call to arms for the people of God. Take a look.
Bishop Bill Hammond is the founder of the Christian International Ministry Network and serves as the bishop to 3,000 ministers and churches. For more than 60 years, he's trained others in activating the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In his latest book, God's Weapons of War, Bishop Hammond identifies the challenges facing believers today and shares how we can rise up together in a fight against the enemy. Oh, please welcome back to the 700 Club our dear friend, Bill Hammond. Bill, it's an honor to have you with us. Good to be here, man. Yeah. You're doing a great job. <laughs> well, so are you. You got a new book out, God's Weapons of War. Um, and I always sort of take a step back when, when prophets are out there saying we need to get weapons of war because it makes me wonder, okay, what, what's the battle to come? What are you seeing in the future? We're we've, in 2008, the Third Reformation began. 2016, uh, God activated the church from on the defensive and neutral to activated to be on the offensive. It's now time for the army of the Lord to arise and to begin to demonstrate and fulfill all the end time prophecies. And I've gone to over 30 nations, led them in corporate warfare. This is the first book out on corporate warfare. That's where saints gather together and use the greatest weapon of warfare that Jesus has given us, which is the shout of faith. And, and the, when I go into the nations, I teach them first on the f first few nights on uh, Jesus being a mighty man of war and that Jesus is a fighter and he'll fight for us. And all of that was for when he was in the land of Canaan mainly to possess all the kingdoms and all the nations in the land of Canaan. And they had to make the kingdoms of Israel, um, of Canaan, the kingdoms of God. Mm -hmm. And just like we're commissioned uh, to make the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of our Lord and this Christ. And he, in order to do that, he had to go to war. Now, we, Israel was in bondage for 400 years, like we were in a thousand-year dark age. But then Moses became the deliverer, and through the blood of the Lamb and all that, they brought us out, Israel, out of Egypt. And each one of their steps portray the restoration movements of God. And like uh, the church was originally uh, in bondage during a thousand-year dark age from 500 to 1500. Well, then God started the second reformation, which was the restoration of the truths and ministries that were lost during the dark age and the ones that dead, dead theologians, dead in the works of the, all that we enjoy in the people you minister to and I minister to in the church today, none of that was available during the dark age. You weren't born, you didn't teach about born again, you weren't baptized in water by mission, you weren't sanctified holy, you weren't filled with the Holy Spirit, you didn't prophesy, you didn't move in the gifts. None of that was there. And it took God 500 years to restore those. Now, but we started, and so the first Reformation was to birth the church, establish it, spread it to the ends of the earth. The second Reformation was to restore back to the church all the truths and menaces that the devil stole and that dead theologians made dead works out of it. And so then in 1500, God started the second Reformation. And so we had the historic Protestant movement, 1500. We had the Anabaptist uh, evangelical movement, 1600, the wholeness movement in 1700. Then we had the divine healing movement, 1880. Then we had the Pentecostal movement in 1900. And then we had the restoration movement in 1948, 50s. And then we had the charismatic renewal that gave everybody a chance to catch up. A Catholic could get born again and baptized in water and sanctified holy, healed, delivered, had hands on them, prophesied to them, and moved against the Spirit all in a week. It took the Holy Ghost 500 years. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but then, uh, then the, the faith movement came in 1970s. In the 1980s, we had the prophetic movement birth at CI in 1988. as an old prophet, 64 years old then. He's young now that I'm 84. Uh, and uh, he said, Bill, how many said in five years there's going to be a move of God take place at your conference that's going around the world? In 1988, four years later, the prophetic movement was birthed at Christian International. And then we had the apostolic and uh, the prophets and apostles had to be restored. I'd prophesied that. And then in then after all five full ministries was restored, we could activate the saints and do what we're supposed to in ministry. So we had the saints movement 2007. Then in 2008, God showed me the third and final church reformation has begun as instituted upon the earth. And now we're in the third reformation. 
the first Reformation was establish the church, bring it into being, take it to the ends of the earth. Second, it's restore it back to be the full church God intended it to be. And now in the third Reformation, all that's going to be fulfilled is end time purposes. The third Reformation is, is the, re the second was to raise up the church, restore the church, because Jesus said, I will build my church. Not just birth and say, hang on till Jesus comes again. But he built the church, and most evangelicals and Pentecostals have no purpose for the church except to win more to the church until you can get raptured out to go to heaven. But God built the church to accomplish his work. When Jesus was here, he was the body of God to fulfill God's purpose on the earth through that body. Then when Jesus the resurrected went back to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit and birthed the church, and the church is now the body of Christ. Paul calls it the body of Christ. And as Jesus' first body was the body of God to fulfill God's will, now we're the body of Christ, and we're God's delegated authority for doing God's will and fulfilling God's purpose. Now we're in the third reformation, and God's raised up. Now the first move of God in the third reformation is the army of the Lord. How, how would you tell a pastor watching right now to... How would you instruct him to, to activate corporate warfare in well, his church? Well, in my book, I give uh, all the ways to do it. And uh, this is my 65th year of ministry, and I've done prophetic and apostolic and warfare most of my life. Like in 1992, God spoke to me to go to the uh, Pacific Rim nations and do warfare to stop the devil's plans for World War III. I did that about every other year. I started out with Korea, uh, Japan, and Philippines, and, and in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore is where we did the most, but we also went to Australia, New Zealand, and California, and I had to find out where all the, Malay where the Pacific Rim nations were, and did warfare on all of those. And God says, these three nations are trying to come together to form a trilateral uh, uh, agreement like Germany, Italy, and Japan did to take over the world, East-West War. So I did that warfare in Singapore, we did it. I got 100 ministers on the platform and I taught them about the shout of faith. It's the greatest weapon of warfare because when you let God arise, when Moses uh, was in the wilderness and the clouds started moving, the fire started moving, he would start off with saying, let God arise and his enemies scattered. And I tell people, when you do the shout of faith, in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, when you shout, you let the Christ in you arise. And when he rises, I said, his power it goes forth. And I bring out that one could put a thousand to flight, two could put 10,000, Deuteronomy 32, 30. But so that means if I shout, I produce 1,000 volts of Holy Ghost light power against the powers of darkness. You join me, we do 10,000. One more joins, we do 100,000. A fourth joins, we do a million. And then a billion, a trillion, and quadrant. Every, every fourth again is another alien. And But 16 is 18 zero, one plus 18 zero. But 100 produce one plus 300 zeros. I tell people when we shout 100, 200, when I was in, when I was in uh, uh, Boca Raton, Colombia with Ricardo Rodriguez, I had 20,000 people there. We shouted uh, into the, and I told him we'd go expose a drug lord and, and the demonic forces have been hiding him. I said, we're going to blast their forces away and the police are going to get him. Two days later, it came out in the paper. They captured him. He's in jail today. We have the power. We are God's delegated authority to execute his purposes on earth. Just as Jesus' body was the body that was to execute God's purposes on the earth at, at, for that period of time. So we are the delegated authority body of Christ. And we've been given all power, all authority over all the power of the enemy. And now as a nation, as the church goes, so the nation goes. I've been telling them for the last 10 years with all the problems that the United States has been going through, the church is a determining factor. You have to win the war in the spirit realm before you can really see it manifest in a natural realm. And the police and the government has to fight it, but we fight it in the spirit realm, and we do have weapons of war. The challenge to preachers is, the Bible says, we have weapons of war for pulling down strongholds and for tearing down principalities and power. And it's not against flesh and blood, but against these armies of demon spirits, uh, spirit works of darkness and all of that. And, but they don't know how to use them. The saints don't know how to use them. But we've entered 
the war. We're at Jericho. The church is not anywhere back here. They're in Jericho. We've crossed over Jordan. We're at Jericho. We're in the military battle. And if you're tired of fighting, might as well go get your little sweet church and get your lollipop. <laughs> Hang on till Jesus comes. Hope you make it. And best, best defense is a good offense. And we're, we're on the offense now to make the kingdom of this world the kingdom of our Lord. Amen. Well, Bill Hammond's book, it's called God's Weapons of War, and I'll make you shout. It's available where books are sold. And also check out our social exclusive interview with Bill on our Facebook page. Just go to facebook.com slash 700 club. Bill, thank you. God bless you, yeah, man. God bless you. <laughs> we'll be back to answer a couple of questions right after this. We always get interesting email from all of you. Here's one that we'd like to share today. This is Susan Gordon who says, what is the difference between psychics and prophets? Some psychics claim to be Christian and pray to the Lord before any predictions are made. Also, why is it not a sin to heed the advice of a prophet, but it is a sin to heed the advice of a psychic? I'm confused. Uh, Susan, the, the confusion shouldn't be there. It's what's the source? What's the source of the word? Uh, psychics are saying that they're consulting with the dead. Uh, psychics could, uh, say they're consulting with spirits. Well, the Bible's real clear on that, uh, that those are demonic voices, and they're designed to destroy you. That's what demons come to do. They want to kill and steal and destroy. Uh, so don't listen to that. Don't go to the tarot card reader. Don't go to the astrologer. Don't go to the psychic. Uh, it's, it's real clear. Now, on the Christian side, on Christian prophets, you got to look at motivation. Uh, if there are prophets like Balaam, where they're motivated by money, uh, or they're you know, trying to get some kind of prestige, there are plenty of false prophets in Israel. You know, just read the book of Jeremiah and you see them. Uh, so what, what, what do you do when you get a prophetic word? Well, the first thing you do is you look for confirmation, and God always wants to confirm it. So he'll give you two or three witnesses to back it up. Uh, that's the, the test, and that's what you look for. Um, it, it's not a sin to question it. And when you get words, even when you get a word from angel, uh, angels, um, it's okay to say, well, here's my fleece, Lord. I want to make sure this is from you. Uh, and he honors that. He always backs up his word to perform it, and he's, he, he'll stand the test. Well, we leave you these words from Corinthians, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For all of us here, God bless you. We'll see you again next week.